Okay, in part four of the muscular system, we're going to look at different types of muscle tissue. We're going to look at fast and slow twitch muscle fibers. Slow twitch fibers, they're the type one. Slow twitch, they contract slowly. They're, it is always oxidative. What does that mean? It means that it breaks down that glucose with oxygen. There's a lot of cellular respiration going on there with aerobic respiration. Uh, mitochondria making a lot of ATP. So you're going to have a lot of mitochondria, a lot of capillaries, a good blood supply, and a lot of myoglobin. What's myoglobin for? We talked about it in the last video. Myo having to do with muscles, globin a protein that holds onto oxygen in that muscle. So it gives it a, a red, the more myoglobin, the more oxidative, the more red the muscle will be. This gives that muscle the red color. Okay, so it is resistant to fatigue has red fibers, the most myoglobin, good blood supply. So we already said has a lot of mitochondria if it's very oxidative. The oxidation of glucose molecules occur mainly in the mitochondria with a lot of oxygen. It's resistant to fatigue, so a not not a lot of glycolysis or aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration is happening here, so less lactic acid, okay, because the oxygen is available because the good blood supply and the myoglobin holding on to those oxygen molecules. You don't have to store as many of the glucose molecules because blood is present. There's uh, lots of capillaries, but the myoglobin holds on to the oxygen, gives that tissue that red-brown pigment color. It would be like what is equivalent to the dark meat of chicken. Okay, fast twitch glycolytic glycolysis fibers type 2. They're white fibers, which means that they have less myoglobin. They have a poor blood supply because it, they're not storing oxygen. They don't need the glucose, so poor blood supply, and it is susceptible to fatigue. The type 2 fast-twitch glycolytic fibers contract rapidly. There are large glyco glycogen reserves, so they're, they're usually larger in diameter. Okay, uh, it's for brief, powerful bursts of energy in contraction, like that we just mentioned that this would be the dark meat, this would be the light meat of the chicken, like the breast of the bird. There's less myoglobin, fewer mitochondria, because there's a lot of glycogen reserves, so you don't need as many mitochondria in a good blood supply and less myoglobin, so it is lighter in color. And then fast twitch, the type 2B, have fast twitch fatigue resistant fibers. You have intermediate fibers, they're oxidative, and intermediate amount of myoglobin, pink to red in color. They're fast oxidative fibers, intermediate fast, not as fast as the slow twitch but intermediate fast. They're aerobic and fatigue resistant, but not as much as the slow twitch. There, there's quite a bit of myoglobin and quite a bit of capillaries, therefore quite a few mitochondria and intermedi intermediate glycogen amount. So most muscles are composed of uh, the all three fiber types, all fibers in a motor unit will be of the same type. All fibers in a motor unit are of the same type. 
the proportion of each of these types is mainly determined by genetics. Um, when I was in college, I was uh, a student athlete plus. I was one of the people who traveled with the recruiters for our basketball team. And we took this young man with us. He was close to seven foot tall. But he could stand under the, the backboard, and from a standing jump, he could take a dime off the top of the backboard. I know he was seven foot tall, but even a seven foot tall person cannot do a standing jump normally and remove a dime from the top of the backboard. It's just near impossible. But this young man had the genetics. I could try, you know, if I were seven foot tall, it'd be a little easier for me, but I would have never been able to do what this young man did. It's all about genetics, and you also have, you have to have um, the environment too. The environment plays a role where a, a person growing and developing these muscles and bones and all. If they do not have the nutrition they need, they're not going to reach the potential of that genetics. So they go together. Now let's talk about, we were talking about the bird. All right, so the slow twitch fibers, most resistant to fatigue. What? Where's the dark meat in chicken that you get from the store? It's in the legs, because what do the chickens do all day? They run around and find food, peck, peck, peck. And if they fly at all, they will just a burst of energy in those wings to fly up on top of the maybe the water jug or something, but they don't fly very for, far, so their wings and their breast are of these fast twitch glycolytic fibers, white fibers. Now, have you ever, do you know of a hunter? Have you ever eaten a duck that was shot in the wild? Now, well, the, a duck that you get in the grocery store is going to have dark meat and white meat of the breast and the wings because their wings are clipped they're grown to uh, sell, sell in the grocery store they're grown in barns or wherever they're uh, limited on the amount of flying they can do but if you shoot a wild duck not so much a turkey but a wild duck a wild turkey is going to have a little more dark meat than white meat, but if you shoot a duck, it's going to have primarily all dark meat because it uses its wings to fly um, a path of migration. So they are using their wings and so they're going to be less white fibers and so you don't really get that dark, you don't get the white meat of the breast and the wings like you would in a store-bought bird. So just to compare those two. Smooth muscle fibers, we're going to change gears just a little bit. We talk, we're talking about skeletal muscles. Now we're talking about smooth muscles. Where would you find smooth muscles? We've talked about this before. In digestive tract, the skin, the rectal pili muscle is a smooth muscle. The iris of your eye is controlled by a, a photo pupillary response is controlled by a two layers of smooth muscles to open and close that pupil, dilation and constriction. Okay, smooth muscle fibers, they're shorter than skeletal muscle fibers. Remember skeletal muscle fibers were it was multinucleated. Smooth muscle fibers have a single nucleus. They're elongated and tapered at the ends. 
their myofilaments are randomly organized compared to skeletal muscle. There are no striations. They lack transverse tubules. They, the sarcoplasmic reticula is not well developed. And we saw this when we looked at the slide of the small intestines and the, the wall of the stomach and the wall of the esophagus had smooth muscles that we looked at when we were looking at tissues. Their visceral smooth muscle this, uh, that we were just talking about, where you have a single unit smooth muscle, sheets of muscle fibers, those elongated spindle-shaped uninucleated cells forming sheets of tissue that we looked at on the slides during our look at histology. The fibers are held together by gap junctions. They exhibit rhythmicity, exhibit peristalsis, found in walls of most hollow organs. They contract more slowly and relax more slowly than skeletal muscles. Now, um, visceral, the sheets of muscles that show rhythmicity and peristalsis. In the stomach, now don't laugh too much at my stomach drawing because I don't have the best tools here, but uh, this is a stomach, by the way. There are going to be longitudinal, longitudinal layers and circular layers. So longitudinal layers, layers of this these smooth muscle sheets going this way in, on the, the stomach. The, with the stomach lining and the esophagus and small intestines, large intestines. So when this sheet of muscle contracts, it shortens the stomach. They go this way. Okay? But there's also another layer. There's actually three layers, but we're going to talk about two at this point. Okay? So you have these circular layers that go across the stomach and when they contract the stomach lengthens and stretches out this way so they work opposite of each other so when this one when the longitudinal layer contracts the circular layer relaxes so it stretches it out and then when the circular layer contracts then the longitudinal layer relaxes so that causes peristalsis as you move churn the food in the stomach and then eventually moving it to the small intestines and along the small intestines and so you're it causes that squeezing of that digestive um, substance through from the stomach to the chyme from the stomach to the, the small intestines and so it pushes it along peristalsis does but what it does in that layers of squeezing there that it pushes it this way and then it sort of pushes it back a little bit but it pushes it forward further than it pushes it back so it goes back and forth back and forth because by the time it reaches the small intestines we're absorbing all of those nutrients and vitamins and water and minerals and electrolytes that we need to put back into the to put into the blood system we're um, absorbing uh, into the into the blood vessels in this area into the the extracellular tissue and into the blood vessels so it can be taken where it's needed so we actually process this the what our food and things that we ingest along the small intestines and we absorb most of of 
these substances in the small intestine. So peristalsis plays a very important role. Okay, the inner lining for the circular fibers run around the circumference, run perpendicular to the longitudinal layer. When contracted, they constrict the lumen. Remember, the lumen is the opening of the organ, causing it to elongate. Peristalsis is the alternating contraction of the longitudinal and circular layers that squeeze things through. Now, multi-unit smooth muscles, fibers function separately. It the irises of the eye and the wall, the blood vessels work this way. So you have, in the irises of the eye, you have two different types of muscles that run two different directions, sort of like here. So there's a set of, of smooth muscles that go this way, circular. And then there's a set of muscles that radiate this way. So when these contract together, it acts like a shutter in a camera to constrict or dilate the pupil. We call that photopupillary response so that the iris can um, constrict or dilate. Smooth muscle contraction resembles skeletal muscle. There's interaction between the actin and myosin. Both use calcium and ATP. Both depend on uh, bioelectrical impulses and neurologic impulses from the nervous system. Most ATP is made anaerobically, so not an, a lot of oxygen is needed. Contractions are slow, and because there's not much oxygen needed, there are fewer mitochondria. Different is different from skeletal muscle contraction in that the smooth muscle lacks troponin. It is a uh, smooth muscle depends on calmodium, calmodulum. This is how you pronounce it. Calmodulin is used by smooth muscle in place of troponin. It binds with the calcium, so you still need calcium ions when the fibers are stimulated. And this triggers the actin-myosin contraction mechanism, calmodulin. There are two neurotransmitters of, that affect smooth muscle action, and that's acetylcholine and norepinephrine, acetylcholine and norepinephrine. Uh, norepinephrine, neurotransmitters, that's what's different between skeletal and uh, smooth muscle, is a skeletal needs acetylcholine primarily, and then smooth muscle uses acetylcholine also and norepinephrine. That can stimulate contractions in some muscles and inhibit and others, so it's excitatory or inhibitory, bringing the muscle closer to an action potential. And when the opposite takes place, it's further from an action potential if it's inhibitory, so it keeps it relaxed. So acetylcholine and norepinephrine. Hormones affect these muscles, um, like the uterus depends on hormones to affect the contractions of the mus uh, the the uterus in a monthly cycle or contractions in delivering a baby are affected by hormones and that's just one example stretching can trigger the smooth muscle contractions so when you have stretching of that stomach and peristalsis it can trigger the contraction of the circular layer of the smooth muscle that causes um, the stretching and then the shortening is the shortening layer is stimulated the longitudinal layer smooth muscle is slower to contract and relax smooth muscle is more resistant to fatigue the stretch provokes contraction stretch provokes contraction and especially 
in peristalsis. Innervation or the nerves needed are served by the autonomic nervous system. What does that mean? Autonomic means it is involuntary. Autonomic nervous system involuntary. So smooth muscles are the only one that use the only type of muscles that use norepinephrine along with the acetylcholine. Cardiac muscle. It's only in the heart. The muscle fibers join together by intercalated discs. The, the fibers will branch. There is a network of fibers that contract as a, as a unit, so there's rhythmicity. Self-exciting and rhythmic has a longer refractory period than skeletal muscles, so you have a contraction and then a, a period of refractory where you don't have another contraction. You have a little, like a period of relaxation that's extended there, so different parts of the heart can contract when they are supposed to. Okay, so the intercalated discs relay the impulses to the next unit, so all contract at the same time. It also holds the cells together. When mo one motor unit contracts, all contract at the same time. So this is called syncytium. Syncytium. Sustained or tetanus muscle contractions do not occur. If you had a sustained or tetanus muscle contract contraction of the heart, what would we call that? Hmm, a heart attack. Refractory, it will not respond to a stimulus until the contraction is complete in that, that short time period. There are self-exciting fibers. If we talked about this before, if you were to take the heart out while it is still beating, it will continue to beat until it runs out of the ATP, calcium, and other ions that are needed to continue the job. Okay, so even out of the chest, that heart could continue to beat without a nervous stimulation. So the nervous stimulation actually, actually regulates heart rate, the rhythm of the heart, and also the strength of the contraction. does not have to do with contraction in itself. Okay, let's review some muscle actions, skeletal muscle actions, and this is pretty much review from lab. Let's go over this. You need it for lab, you need it for lecture. Okay, so the origin of a muscle, this coracoid process in the, on your last lab practical, you needed to know this is the, uh, and the, um, Right above the glenoid cavity on the scapula are the two attachment points for the biceps brachii. These are called the origins of the bicep brachii. This is like the beginning. And then the um, insertion of the biceps brachii. The insertion is usually attached to the part that is going to be moved. Okay? This is somewhat immovable, but this is the movable part. So the insertion is what is going to be moved. So we know the action of the biceps brachii is flexion of the elbow. So when it contracts, it's going to flex this elbow. Okay, so the prime mover, we talked about this in lab, or you probably heard about this in lab. It's also called an agonist, the prime mover. When we're talking about flexion of this elbow, the prime mover is going to be the biceps brachii. We know that's the action of the biceps brachii. But usually there is an antagonist that works along with the prime mover. It resists the prime mover's action and causes movement in the opposite direction. Okay, so when this muscle contracts, it shortens, and um, that prime mover is concentric. There's concentric forceful 
contraction to shorten that muscle. At the same time, you have control lengthening or eccentric contraction of this triceps to control that movement so you don't sock yourself. Okay, so it controlled lengthening. That would be the antagonist in the flexion of the elbow. All right, so the prime mover with flexion of the elbow would be the biceps brachii, and the antagonist would be the triceps brachii. It resists the movement of the biceps to give you a controlled, smooth movement. Okay, so if we were talking about extension of this elbow, then we know that that's the action of the triceps brachii. So now with the extension of the elbow, the triceps brachii has become the prime mover or agonist. And so that you don't hyperextend that elbow and you have smooth movement, we have eccentric contraction lengthening of the biceps brachii to control that movement and it's working against the triceps with controlled lengthening. So the biceps brachii in this instance would be the antagonist. Now synergist, a lot of the leg muscles that you studied, like the, um, the, the femoral muscles, the um, hamstring muscles and all work as synergists. They work assist each other in movement of that thigh. So you have sets of muscles that assist the prime mover in a wanted movement. Lifespan changes, myoglobin, ATP, and creatine phosphate decline as a person ages by 80. You have half of the muscle mass as atrophied. Exercise can slow this down. Adipose cells and connective tissue replace muscle tissues. Exercise can slow this down. Exercise helps to maintain muscle mass and functions. Exercise, exercise, walking, getting up, moving. It also happens when motor neurons are severed from a muscle. So um, you need to remember this, that adipose tissue and connective tissue replaces muscle tissues. If the motor neuron is severed from the muscle, like in the case of a spinal cord injury or some uh, type of injury that severs the motor neurons from the muscle, then you're going to have atrophy of that muscle. A muscle undergoes atrophy from age or lack of use or the severing of the motor neurons reduced and uh, a muscle that atrophies, you have reduced capillary networks. These are things you need to remember. Reduced capillary networks, reduced number of mitochondria, reduced size of actin and myosin. And it comes from age or lack of use or uh, paralysis, motor neurons severed, etc., etc. Okay, um, I am not going to ask you about myasthenia gravis. Just know it's an autoimmune disorder um, where the res receptors for acetylcholine on the muscles are attacked and it results in weak and easily fatigued muscle results, difficulty swallowing and chewing. Ventilator is needed later on in the, in the process of this uh, condition. Treatments include drugs that boost the acetylcholine so the muscles work, removing the thalamus glands, immunosuppressive drugs, and antibodies. There are some things that you do need to remember. The botulinum toxins. Botulinum toxins, it is usually um, will cause the prevent, prevention of the release of acetylcholine. So what happens if you have the um, a toxin that prevents the release of acetylcholine? Well, then the muscle doesn't work. Well, what do we call that when the muscles don't work? Well, that's called paralysis. 
the so a botulinus toxin botulism from botulism prevents the release causes of uh, acetylcholine causes paralysis prevents muscle contraction and this is a toxin at the neuromuscular junction and so you might be able to kill all off the botulinus organism pathogen but it's the toxin so you have to treat with antitoxins not just antibiotics and uh, one of the most important muscles that we've talked about before that is important to us is our diaphragm so as the botulinus toxin kicks in then uh, the person can very easily suffocate from not being able to breathe we already talked about clostridium tetani there it is spelled out for you clostridium tet tetani contracts all the muscles at one time it is a neurotoxin that causes tetanic contraction of all the muscles eventually it starts in the face and so it's called lockjaw and to prevent this toxin from uh, doing us harm we take a, a tetanus shot it's like an antitoxin to those um, clostridium tetani toxins okay one more thing rigor mortis ah after death this begins to happen because there is a drop in ATP and a rising of calcium so when you have a drop in ATP after death and a rise in calcium the muscles will harden okay this lasts for about 12 hours and then decomposition begins to break down the calcium and then the muscles will soften soften again so a person soon after they die their muscles will be, be hardened and so if they're sitting in a chair then it's hard to stretch them out on a stretcher as they carry the body out because of rigor mortis and after about 12 hours then the body can be repositioned and uh, so for forensics and forensics when at a crime scene or such or if they're just trying to determine the time of death of an individual they look at the, rig the onset of rigor mortis and the timing of that and I'm gonna show you the next three slides one a friend of our family was taking a forensics anatomy and physiology forensics class as a graduate class at the University of Dundee Scotland flatmate with my daughter and this was one of her projects this is a um, actual person's it is a person that lived hundreds of years ago she had measurements of this person's skull and she was able to reconstruct this person's head and attach the muscles to show the um, the shape of the nose the shape of the face and the, all you would have to do is lay over the skin and so her specialty is facial reconstruction when she finds a skeleton so i thought you might like to see this now that's the end of the chapter on muscles and so go through the videos and study for the next exam and i'll see you when we start to talk about the nervous system